born in Germany, and he will be talking about advances in Salix technologies for up optimal selection. As usual, the webinar will be recorded and made available on the OTS website in a few days. And all webinar participants are muted to minimize the background sound levels. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and Gunther will answer them at the end of the talk. Thank you very much and over to Gunther. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for this very brief kind of introduction and uh, hello to everybody who's on the list and who's joined this, this webinar. So actually, it's my first one. It's bloody hot in, in Germany, so don't worry if I'm sweating a little bit, but it's really hot inside my office. But I will do my best to go through this Advances in Celex Technology um, seminar in the next couple of minutes. It's rather half an hour to 50 minutes, and I'm happy to answer your questions right away after this. So that's the, the agenda I would like to walk you through. In um, very briefly, so I will give you a very brief introduction to Aptimus, and I guess most of you are familiar with it, but just as a reminder what we're talking about. And then I will go over to the limitations of Aptimus generation that we, we see currently in the lab and in, in applications, and then how we solve them. I will give you some examples and then go over to the, the modified Aptimus versions that cover a portion of this talk, so it's the phosphate, deoxyribose, ribose modified aptimus, those that have an expanded genetic alphabet, the nucleate base, modified aptimus, and I will finish with two specific examples from our lab, and I will walk you through in more, in more details at the end of the, the seminar. So aptimus, as most of you should know, they're short and structured nucleic acids. They fold into um, diverse structures, it can bind to proteins with, with high affinity and specificity, and of course also to small molecules and other kind of targets that have been used for aptamer generation. What you can see here on the left is a, a, a kinase that binds to aptamer, and the aptamer binds into the um, kinase pocket, and the ATP binding sites with aptamers can really bind to clefts. And on the right, you see the, probably the most famous example of, of an aptamer for protein, which is the thrombin binding. HD1 aptimer, the thrombin binding aptimer, that falls in the G cortex structure and binds more rather on the surface of the, of the thrombin exercise one. Um, based on this binding activity, the aptimers can be exploited or applied to various applications and for various purposes. I've listed here a few. You just you can use them to validate the target in cells and animal models. You can use them for therapy approaches. Um, exemplified by Makogen, you can use them in diagnostics, which is one of the most prominent applications, I would say so, but also in high throughput screening examples or applications and for just to purify a target from complex mixtures and for allow separation and for, for the further downstream analysis. So just to, to name a few and in most of these examples, aptimers have been shown to be quite useful. So the basic process we're talking about today is, is this process shown here. It's a CELEX procedure. So we start right away with a DNA library and I will walk you through briefly, of course, because all individual steps are, are important for the advances that we have seen in the past 10 years, I have to say. So we start with a DNA library, mainly it's single-stranded. We can order the, um, the um, these libraries from a commercial vendor. So they basically have this complex, um, the total randomized uh, central part, they have a five prime constant region and a three prime constant region for allowing them to be handled by PCR, by virus transcription and PCR and transcription. So if you use them as a DNA, we, we generate the single strand DNA and we incubate it with a target molecule. And upon this approach, some of these optimists bind to the target, then we remove the non-bound species, we recover the bound ones, amplify them by PCR or by RT-PCR, and then we have a the one cycle of enrichment done. And typically we do five to, to 15, sometimes even more in vitro selection cycles as shown here, before we go for clonal sequence to get these aptimers, the monoclonal sequences bind to specific target molecule with high affinity and hopefully with high specificity. So among the various target molecules that have been deployed for aptimer selection, I just show here a few of them that we have used in the lab. Small molecules are very dominant and in the, in the literature, they have been reviewed here from by us, and there's a recent example for tetrahydrocannabinol aptimer. I will come back at the end of the talk. Proteins are also one of the most targeted um, compounds 
and that have been used for optimal selection, trade optimus for especially in the fields of therapeutics and diagnostics, but also nucleic acids have been used by some of the uh, some groups, amongst others by us. And these are homogeneous purified target molecules. And I come back to more complex targets in, in the course of the selection that also have been covered. So, but this is a reflection of what most people are using. So the limitations that we see in optimal generation are um, multifaceted and, and a very strong limitation that many that have been done or have used optimal selection is a PCR bias that we have in the selection process. So most of the selection processes that we do in the lab, they are relied to, to PCR and PCR is an artificial process or can be very artificial and we will see how we can get over this in, in the next slides. Then for small molecule targets or target immobilization, so if you need to immobilize the target molecule on a surface, of a, let's say, magnetic particle, sephirosis, we need to do chemistry to mobilize them. This means also that we, we, we lose a specific or a potative target site that can be targeted by the aptomers um, because it's coupled and we generate new epitopes that may be also involved in, in, in aptomer binding. So this is a, a limitation and there are ways to overcome it. And often I put this note here. So there are natural RNA molecules that have been found in nature, they are these so-called virus that just bind to metabolites, to small metabolites in cells, and they have very high affinity. And if you look at them, you see that the, these RNA molecules are binding very tightly and which each and every domain of the small molecule and making contacts there, then they're, thereby they get really high affinities. So another issue is stability in body fluids and the targeting properties that might be lost from an in vitro to an in vivo setting low success rates, so this is also a very important aspect, and that it itself, even if it appears as a simple cyclic iterative process, it is quite laborious and it's not established in many labs around the world, and so access is limited to, to aptness. So the PCR bias of selection and artifacts that we see is something that you typically look at, it looks like that. So what you can see on the top here in this slide is an agarose gel analysis, of a PCR that we have run through an in vitro selection process. So that's actually from our lab. So you see here, that's the letter. This is the, the library that we use. So that's the double-stranded DNA that you get from each selection cycle. And that's selection cycle one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And what you see here is that you not only get the band that you get during the perfect amplification behavior, but you also get artifacts, which is, that's not tip, that's a typical side product that we can have seen many times. There can be different side products that we observe sometimes, it can be smaller, it can be over amplificates, but this is typically an artifact that we not name over amplificate, but this is something that happens in selection. So my advice to everybody who is doing in vitro selection, who is seeing something like this, don't use the library again. So and try to avoid um, extended PCR cycling during the select. So it's a it's a, a balance, I have to admit. So we want to have a very accurate and harsh and rigorous selection step. So meaning that most of the RNA molecules or DNA molecules that are binding to the target are, um, are separated from the unbound. And as more stringent this, this step is, the more easy it would be to, to use less selection cycles to amplify the bound species. But on the other hand, you need more PCR cycles to amplify the bound species, which can be more error prone as, as having a, a kind of balanced way to, to PCR. So this is something that people always see or often see in the lab, but you can avoid this if you have a careful library primer design. So be careful with the primer binding site, test a few of them, see if they have um, produced series of DNA libraries let's say three to four different ones with three to four different primer binding pairs, and just test them in a, in a consecutive PCR dilution PCR series. If this doesn't yield them something like this, then you have a great chance that selection will also not produce a, a profile like this. So there are other methods that are more elaborated right now, and these are the so-called emulsion PCR and droplet PCR, which would also help you to amplify nucleic acids not as a pool, 
but in a compartment. So this means that each nucleic acid is, is recovered from the target, is separated in a separate compartment, so it doesn't compete for the primer, doesn't compete for the polymerase and for the DNTPs with other, uh, other um, nucleic acid species that might be better replicators than others. So you get a more evenly distributed application rate with this. And the droplet PCR is also available that it can be used for this. And so, and Michael Rickelink from at Strasbourg, he provided a, a new way how we can really drip the droplet based selection schemes where you couple the droplets with activity and the fluorescent readout, and you can sort the positive and the negative ones. So, this is also something that, that could be done to avoid these PCR artifacts. But don't worry, so you can, PCR artifacts are known all around the place. So people who are doing CELEX, they know this and this can happen. And it's not a sign that you do mistakes in the lab. It's just that some libraries are more prone for ampl over amplification or for, for the generating artifacts. And then just skip this library, go to another one that maybe behave a bit better. If you cannot have access to this emulsion, a dropper PCR or even dropper based selection applications. So that's this leads us to the to the next um, point, which is so a molecules targetization leads to loss of interaction site. So I've given you an example here below that's from our own lab. So that's THC. And if you use the THC the acid to immobilize it on the beads, then you can see that this molecule is very different from that molecule. That's the magnetic particle that we've used for immobilization. So here we generate a new epitope that's an amide in comparison to an um, carbonic acid. And this means that the electronic density and electronic properties of this ring system here is very different from this ring system. here, And this can have an impact for binding. And you generate an epitope that this could have an impact also in direct interactions with the enriched larvae. So this is something that we consider as problematic, in, in, um, especially in the generation of aptimus for small molecules. And there are ways to, to overcome this. And one of the most, um, now I have to say, re-discovered uh, um, procedures to capture six process. So capture six processes have been published um, years ago. But now there's a renaissance kind of this method. Also, we are doing it in the lab. And others have identified this. And that's in the process which is, is based on a, a library. That's a very, so these are the primary binding sites. And these are the random regions. But then you have kind of a so-called docking sequence, which is also fixed. It has a specific sequence. It can be 10 to 15 nucleotides. And you use this um, docking sequence to immobilize the library on beads, which is has a complementary oligonucleotide on it. So the, these sequences are hybridizing with Watson Creek base pairing. Then you wash away all the non paired sequences. And then you recover bound uh, nucleic acids by simply adding the, uh, the target in solution. And thereby it is assumed that the target interacts with the RNA and induces a conformational change. And by this conformational change, um, this hybridization is broken. And then you can just simply use the supernatant and amplify and go through this process again and again and again. And, and that's something which avoids um, um, target immobilization procedures and allows you to select aptamers which has very high affinity for small molecules and it can be also multiplexed and so on and so forth. Yeah. So what we, some, some people do overnight incubation to achieve the perfect annealing here. We have reduced it to, to a specific degrees, so to 21 degrees. That's the incubation that we are using currently. And, and you do some purification of this, and then you just run through this process again and again and again. So in this way, the Capture 6 process is um, something which is it's published. You can use it. Um, you don't need the immunization of the target. You also don't need the chemistry with the small molecules, so it should be more straightforward for molecular biology labs. Docking sequence is incorporated in the random region. There are different ways how you can do this, more to the five prime, more to the three prime end, more central, and so on. You can play around with this, and you can play also play around with the, how long it is, and so on. And so I really would, um, and, and so we're doing it in the lab, and we think it's for small molecules, it's very, very helpful. Another process which have been, has been um, 
reported by Kralov and Bowser and co-workers is the, the capillary electrophoresis separation of RNA target or DNA target complexes with a specific instrument. This is also an approach which does not need the immobilization of a target. It's more prone for using uh, proteins as targets yet but um, also for some reports of some smaller molecules, which is around one, kilo, um, one kilodalton can be used as well, but they require a specific instrument, so the capillary electrophoresis system, the specific buffer requirements that are um, compatible with the electrophoresis system. So there's a bit of limitation here, and also the, the equipment needs to be trained and teached on people, and so this is also quite different, but it has been shown to be very rapid, you need less selection cycles. The complexity of the library is also lower that you can use in these selection procedures, but they also, uh, this method is also suitable to generate high affinity aptimers and um, uh, for targets where you don't want to do an, an immobilization of the target molecule. But this is from the, from the separation techniques. So these are the, the, the newbies, I would say, in terms of, of homo homogenized, homogeneous targets. So capture says NCE and be careful with the library design and the margin PCR or droplet PCR and separation methods for the, to overcome PCR artifacts. Um, but there is, um, for applicability of, of libraries of DNA or RNA in human samples, there's been also quite a few of, of modifications. So that's a, quite an old slide from a publication from my lab the review where mainly backbone modification have been used to increase the stability in nuclease resistance of, of DNA or RNA molecules in um, human samples or human matrices like urine or blood or plasma. But these are mainly tackling the two prime position of, of, the, um, of nucleotides and many of them are quite well known and most therapeutic aptimers that are out there currently have the fluoride modification on the pyrimidines and cytidine and uridin, and a few have the methoxy modification additionally on adenine or gonosine, and also very favorable is the LNA modification. And important is of these, all these triphosphates have been shown to be at least have a certain compatibility with the enzymatic steps of the in vitro selection process. This is which is important to know because um, they can be directly incorporated into the sex itself. Right? So we're using fluoro modifications with the cytidine and the uridine in our lab, uh, which, is, which is really, really straightforward to use with uh, a polymerase, a mutant of the T7 RNA polymerase, and it's very compatible with the RT and the PCR steps. So this is, th th that's out there for a long time. And Makuchin, so the, the one and only therapeutic aptimer that has been approved by the FDA and the EMA, is, this is made of the fluorocytidine, the fluoridine, and methoxy adenine guanine nucleotides and has still two, two um, hydroxyl residues in it, but this has been selected just from libraries that contain these modifications. Newer developments, which are really, I think, kind of um, um, groundbreaking, is the work that Phil Holliger has presented recently is very strong modifications like the SINA and the ANA and FANA of the backbones and the TNA and stuff. So this is not very straightforward forward for everybody else to use, but because it always requires that they are, in, so that the work that Phil is doing is they are also um, developing um, polymerases by in vitro evolution approaches that can incorporate these modified building blocks into DNA, into RNA. So which is uh, very important to know that you have, there's always a combination between the polymerase and the, and the backbone, as you can see here from these um, primary extension slides and experiments. But changing the, 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 the chemistry of the backbone is, in this case, not only a stability issue, but also enables different kind of stereochemistry and different kind of, of interactions that these DNA libraries can do with the target molecule. And in a very recent study, uh, Phil and his group has um, accomplished that they can generate a non-charged backbone, which is for many in vivo applications, also cellular applications, a very promising modification. So again, here they, they generated a, a, a polymerase that can incorporate these building blocks 
into a DNA with these um, phosphonates here, and it's a fully non-charged um, nucleic acids. And I think there's a very promising field or a potential field of therapeutic application of these type of molecules. And again, but they developed these enzymes that can handle this, and this is, that's a, a, a great progress in, in the optimal field, I think. So another issue that people or scientists sometimes see is that they selected an aptimer in vitro, but in vivo, they lose kind of targetability. Yeah. And targetability in what I mean here is that, okay, a strong field in, in aptimer generation and development that has been um, developed in the past, let's say, 10 to 12 years, is using aptimers to deliver cargo molecules to specific tissues like tumor tissue or pathogenic tissue. And so and what people are doing is something like this. So they have an aptimer that binds to the cell surface, but what we often see is that these aptimers not only bind to the cell surface, but also are taken up by the cells once they reach the cell and reach their specific receptor on the surface. And if you then equipped these aptimers with cargos like small molecules like photodynamic therapy molecules or chemotherapeutics, but also toxic proteins or nucleic acids that inhibit specific proteins or microRNAs or, or mRNAs or by expression proteins, then we can use these aptimers as a kind of trionic horses to really um, deliver specific cargo into a diseased cell type, tumor type, and then get rid of the tumor. So this is something people want to do, but what we have seen in the lab also is that if you do complex targets mixtures, so how do we get these aptimers that bind to a specific um, cell surface? We either use cells in culture and go ahead with them, and can use tissue on slides, uh, we've shown recently, but also we can address tumors in vivo. And this is advantage is because we have seen that if you address cells in culture and then use these aptimers that come from these cells, and try to um, use these in vivo, this not always works. It, there are examples out there in literature where this works brilliantly, like the PSMA aptimer or the telecine aptimers and others. But for some of these approaches, we, we, we didn't accomplish this. And it's, this is reasonable, of course, because if you look at the tumor microenvironment of a cell in culture and of the tumor in vivo, they are very different from one another. And so that's why me and I, so Bruce Salinger's lab in 2010, discovered or developed an in vivo selection approach. And we have done this also for, for specific prostate cancer cell line. And how this goes is shown here. So what we did, and this is an, an autotopic tumor model. So we implanted a PC3 cell line into the prostate of male mice, let them grow. And then after a while, we, we injected uh, um, a DNA library into the tail vein of this mouse. Then we tried like, let circulate this um, DNA for 20 minutes. We perfused the organ, the, the, the mouse with, with PBS, and then we extracted the tumor, as you can see here. We covered the DNA from the aptimus here, and then we amplified DNA again, and went through this process for 10 sele selection cycles. We did then a next generation analysis. I come back to this later, and did an vivo screening. And by this, um, we did this screening, so we had an infrared dye, infrared dye here, and we had an 11 kilonewton pack at this end, and we used the subcutaneous model and the autotopic model in the mouse and injected the library, the, the, the specific sequences here, and from this, what you can see is that, okay, here, that's the library, you see the distribution after five minutes, so the entire library, the mouse is, is fluorescing, but after a while, fluorescence is cleared, and you don't see the library here in the tumor after th three hours, but you see this sequence here, it still retains in the tumor material, and but you can't see this here very well. So this is corrupted from the upload. But you would see that this targeting here is very stable among six mice that we have tested. So it's published here. You can look it up, and it's very the heterogeneity of this aptimer targeting is very reliable and reproducible. And it's a plain DNA with a pack, so it's it's non-modified DNA, and it proves that you can use non-modified DNA in in vivo selection, and it proves also that we can use the individual DNA molecules in an in vivo setting. And we also have seen that it targets the autotopic tumor model. So that's the way I think 
people we can uh, scientists can overcome this targeting issues from an in vitro to an in vivo setting and clearly gives us a way to to, to a multitude of different aptamers in, in for targeting so this so that's the in vivo stuff so that there are a few examples out for in vivo selections so the first one by Bruce Salinger's lab and there are a few others and, and most of them are using 2 pump fluoroRNA with used DNA and but this now we switch again a little bit the gears to more in vitro work and um, two things that always come up when people start to work with optimal selection and and they're not doing this in a lab that have established it for a while so they're trying to establish it on their own and this is sex is laborious it takes a lot of time and thereby the access to Aptimus is limited and the low success rates that we've seen and others have seen with Aptimus selection, which is around about 25 to 30 yeah. percent. So this limitation illustrated here by this funnel is you, you take 10 targets into a selection process. So that's the selection process. Most of them fail and some of them for then you get a target. So this means 10 targets. Statistically, if these are 10 protein targets, we get three Aptimus or three enrichments successfully done for these protein targets and that's a very low success rate yeah. and um, we what we did in the past years is we tried to to overcome these limitations that okay people are coming to our lab because they would like to have an aptomer selected for this or that protein so they come to our lab and and um, we teach them on doing so and they do the selection but then the target is not suitable for optimal generation and then there's, there's a big disappointment, yeah, which I can fully understand because then you're investing three to six months for the entire process for teaching and selection and you don't get an aptima that you want to have. So what we did in our lab in the past three years, so we, we established an automated selection procedure. So Andy Ellington has published this, a similar version um, in 1998 already. And so we built now something like a, an automated robotic system 2.0 which should, can do eight selections in parallel, but they can also do just one or three or five. And just for the selection, to give you an idea what this takes is so the manual selection, these are data from our lab. I think it's one about 30 different selections that we put in here. It's, so that's just the selection time we need. So for starting from the first selection cycle, it doesn't mean the pre-work and the downstream work, it just mean the selection from the first to the 12th selection cycle and it takes us run about a bit more than 10 days in our lab to do this 10 working days of a phd student if you do the automated selection it takes us two days and we can do eight targets in parallel just for the selection and we don't need to train people on doing so we can just take the target run it through our system and then we see relatively quickly whether this does work or not so andy ellington has shown this for for rna years ago. Also, we have published on RNA automated selections um, in 2008 already. But um, so with the newer model that you can see here, we also can do 2 pump fluoro RNA. So they all have a 2 pump fluoro pyridin um, molecules attached to. And we can run through this in an automated version. These are monoclonal lab tumors that we get out of the, out of the automated process. They're 2 pump fluoro modified to bind with high affinity. And this just published recently. So and we're doing this more and more now in our lab and try also to establish DNA and modify DNA, as you will see later on. And we offer this as a service. So if you come across this and have a target, just some advertisement for our center here, just let us know and we can come up with a collaboration or something like this and we just run it through the robotic system. And we have a very early on investigation whether this is working nicely or not and whether it's worthwhile to further invest some resources into that. So next generation sequencing as a new technology that come up in the past 10 years as well is also something that I think opens a new area in CELEX. So that's what we have done years ago. So we sequenced from the rich library, let's say 100 sequences per selection cycle. And maybe we sequenced the last selection cycle. We had to pay two to three euros per plasmid and all done this manually and so on. Now what we can do is we use this alumni instruments or any other um, high throughput sequencer that you have. We can sequence one to five million sequences of each libraries from each selection cycle and we pay around about 10 to 70 euros per selection cycle. And this 
allows us a very deep insight in what happens during the selection process. And the results that you can see here, so this is the in vivo selection I've showed you before. So this is the, we actually have done two selections, one with a plain DNA, that's the D3 library, one with the pegylated DNA library, so it's at the same primer binding site and everything the same, just the pack here. And you see this is the selection cycle 0 to 10, 10 cycles that we've done, and that's the number of unique sequences that we find in the selection. And you see that this declines here, and this declines here with a very different profiles, but in the end we have we get out of the selection with around about 10% to 8% of, of, of unique sequences, so which is an indication that there's a strong enrichment that took place. And also you can look at the distribution of the nucleotides among the, um, uh, the, the random region, as you can see, so each color is a different nucleotide, A, C, G, and T, and see that's almost evenly distributed in the library as it should be. And then you see there's something happening after seven selection cycles, and after 10 you see a clear, very altered distribution of nucleotides. So we can look at these parameters, and we can look at the copy numbers, so this is, these are just below 10, so most of the library has below 10 copy numbers up to selection cycle five. And you get, if you go on, you see that there are high copy number sequences coming up here. Again, this is a complex and target structure is not homogeneous. So homogeneous, this would look like a very different. So there's much more strong enrichment here. And that's again, the profile of the pegylated. So you can look very closely into this. And this helps us very much with identifying um, different types of, of sequences with different amplification profiles, enrichment profiles, and to find those sequences that maybe perform best independent of FM amplification behavior and maybe it allows us to discover new sequences that we would not see with just looking at let's say 100 sequences from each individual selection cycles. So I think that that's also a game changer. So how can we overcome the low success rate? So we have talked about stability, uh, background modifications, Phil Holliger's work and and all the modifications that have been in place for years now. Low success rates um, are something that bothers app people who, in, who are in the field very much. So we would like to be able to select Aptimus for each target that we have, but that's hardly possible. Um, but um, there are ways to overcome this very slightly, and this means expanding the chemical diversity of nucleic acid libraries. So which is quite clear an issue. So if you look at nucleic acids, they have four building blocks. These are these four here. So A, G, C, and T, or U, if you use R and A, the chemistry of these building blocks is, okay, they are aromatic. They are, there's the ribose backbone or the oxyribose backbone, and there are um, um, phosphate charged backbones, right? But if you look at amino acids with four antibodies, the proteins, the chemical diversity is much broader, right? And if we can use this, at least to a certain extent, we should be able to change atoms for many more targets that are in place. So what people have done in, reg in respect of this is two approaches that I will end up my talk here. Is the first approach is um, they're expanding the genetic alphabet with new base pairs. And these are the base pairs that have been developed. So this is Stephen Benner's base pairs. They have developed this is the base pair from um, Hirao, and this is the base pair from Rumusberg, and all these, well, so these are the canonical base pairs, this base pair and this base pair from Benner and Hirao's lab, they have been used for optimal selection. And it's interesting what they accomplished with this. So this is the artificial expanded genetic information system from the Benner group. So they use this DZDP base pair, which still relies on what's the quick base pairing on not what's the quick but on a um, hydrogen bonding base pairing system and they use this to target a specific cell line so a complex target cell line um, um, for aptimal selection and what they ended up with is an aptimal the sequence is shown here which has two modified nucleotides here the set and the p these two here and that's the binding of the aptimal if you replace the set 23 or the P30, that's set 23, that's P30. If any of the canonical ones, you lose binding completely. It shows that, okay, this is not only, it's probably an aptimal has been selected, depends on this modification, yeah? which is in, in very interesting and very, very cool because you have a, a broadened alphabet and this is very 
beneficial. They've extended their approach to another system where they transfected a specific protein into a cell line that doesn't have the protein, a specific receptor on the surface, just a glucagon receptor. So glucagon is expressed in these cells, so the glucagon positive, and they use this cell line for optimal generation, again using the set and P um, a base pair. And also here, they succeeded with vatomers that rely on, on binding so the, on, on the presence of these modifications. So that's the set, there's a P here. So for instance, LG8, this is the sequence down here, which binds only to the, to the glucagon expressing cell line, but not to the, to the native cell line. And also, again, it relay, these, these sequences rely on the presence of the modifications for binding. So Hirao has a different base pair, it's more hydrophobic base pair. And he applied this, uh, he and his group, he applied this to the specific targets with this selection scheme, which are um, BGF and interferon. And what you can see here is that the, these modifications induce a very strong shift in affinity. So what you can, so that's the, the selected aptimer for VGF. And this has two modified building blocks, the DAS and the DS here and here, and it has a very high affinity, 0.65 picomolar, and which is among the strongest we have seen so far. And if you change them for, for the canonical basis, you see still a reasonable binding affinity with 347 picomolar, but this has clearly an impact. And the same behavior is found here with the other target that they have used. And this high affinities are very interesting and very useful probably for diagnostic but also for therapeutic application of these where affinity and specificity matters a lot. So finally, I come up with, with the approach that um, has been first uh, published by Latham and Allen Research in 1994, where people try or scientists try to extend the chemical base and the chemical repertoire of nucleotides by adding modification at the C5 position of pyrimidines, here the, the uracil, and incorporate this into DNA. So this was the very first example targeting thrombin, and, but some logic, I have to say, have, have, they have pioneered this and expanded this to a series of, of aptimers that they've selected and generated over the past decade. And they're using this chemistry here, but they can add these diff very, very different modifications. They have a series of modifications but mainly they have used BNU, the benzyl, um, and tryptophan, but also um, modifications. And, and why is that? And so there's a reason for that, because antigen binding side of antibodies, if you look at the nucleotide, uh, of, sorry, of the amino acid distribution in these um, antigen binding sites of antibodies, you see that um, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, they are over um, represented there. So that's why they try to use these molecules here. And with this, they have shown that they can overcome the limitations of optimal selections and increase the success rate up to 85%, as they have reported in, in the PLOS One publication down here. And what's very interesting, if you look into the structures, so they also have the co-crystal structures of some of the targets here with, with, um, with their somomers, that's how they call these, these aptimers. And then you see that they're not only involved directly in target binding, so the, the modifications are not only involved in, in target binding, but they're also involved in forming specific motifs, like this benzyl zipper, where there's a um, stacking of the benzyl moiety and with the nucleotide, with the neighbor nucleotide, or the naphthyl zipper. So they're forming specific new motifs, which is very exciting to see. And so like hydrophobic patches as well. And, but of course, they're also involved in target binding. And what, what Soma Logic is doing right now, they, have, they can measure up to 5,000 proteins in human samples using these somomers that, are, that bind to the targets with very high affinity and specificity and transfer this to a specific microarray type of, of readout and to inform on, on specific disease where they have differential analysis of different tissues. So what we have done, and that's uh, what I want to show you in the end of this, we have we've used a, a different approach compared to somologic to, to incorporate modifications into nucleic acid libraries. And this is, we are making use of this EDU, so ethanol DU modified and nucleotide, which is commercially available and can be incorporated into DNA just by PCR. 
but as a triphosphate of this nucleotide available, can be used by many enzymes. You can incorporate this, and after incorporation, you can use these A-sites and click in your modified um, or your chemical modification at WISH. So we have used this um, to generate the library and to use this indole modification to click in and had run about 0 to 10 modifications in each strand and used this to do an in vitro selection scheme, which is for us, at least it works like this, that we are ordering this, we buy this from a commercial vendor, then we modify the library with our modification at wish, then we do the selection and we can use the recovered, so the bound species directly in the PCR, where we're using then the ethanol DU again and so it's any kind of an imprint version and replace the modification by this EDU residue and then do the digestion to the single strand and then just go through the cycle process again and again and again and again. So and we have used at first a, a, a typical model target, so GFP, for which we at least could not select in DNA aptomer so far, but we've used this in, in our lab, we can copper and couple it to magnetic beads so it's easy to follow. Um, that the target is still there and so on. And we went through 15 selection cycles. And what you can see is that in a uh, flow cytometer analysis, where we have um, the, the fluorescence modified larvae bound to the beads. And that's how it looks like after 15 selection cycles. And that's how the starting larvae looks. So you can clearly see an enrichment. We also see that the enrichment is depending on the presence of the click in. So if you don't click in, you don't see binding. So that's what, what you see here. So you can clone a sequence and we have this, we focused on this family of sequences on which we have chosen the top one, the C12, for further analysis. So that's the binding of the monoclonal, that's the binding of its scrambled version. You can see here, so it's clearly an aptomer that binds there. And you see that we also have some specificity, so that's binding of the aptomer to the GFP that we used during the selection. That's another variant of GFP, that's ERG and that's streptavidine. Again, scrambled in gray and the optimum in green. And we see a reasonable KD value of, let's see, 20 nanomolar to GFP, as you can see here, and that's the binding to the MB GFP. What is more important to us is at the first as proof of concept was that not only binds of high affinity to, um, to the target molecule, but it also is click dependent. So as we have seen, it doesn't bind without the click in. But if you choose other click ins that, can, that are similar, like hydrophobic, and aromatic or non-aromatic or have a, a mine residue, see that you always lose binds. It's clearly only binds if you have the indole present, but not with anything else. And we can also focus and nail it down to specific residues in, in this um, sequence. So you, if you look at so the X, these are the, the, the specific EDUs that we have in here. So at this, this position and this and this position, these are conserved among this um, sequences here. And among them, we see that if you modify only uh, all of them, but just one knot, so like here, this is 23T means that we have um, this position, just a T and all the others, they have the indole or this 24T means at this position, a T and all the other positions have the indole. You can see that with these two positions here and this positions, we strictly require an indole residue for binding and this position 62T here, is independent, you can you leave it out and you can have a, a, a T here and still bind. So this means that there's also a position effect that we needed at specific sites to really allow high affinity binding to a target. So we've extended this approach to um, another selection, which is um, we tried to, to target tetrahydrocannabinol with aptomers. And we started this process years ago and I had a very talented PhD student and she tried to do it with many different approaches. So these are seven selections that she has done with different libraries, so 2 fluoroRNA, G quadruplex libraries, um, different length of random regions and 75 and 43 G quadruplex DNA, G quadruplex RNA, with THC on magnetic beads, with THC on zephyrosis, different buffer systems, different types of illusions and so on. And the, the basic message, we never got any aptomer for, or we're not, not able to enrich something. So this is a typical situation that we have if targets evade or escape the selection process. But when we change this to, to the click selects approach that we're using, so what we did there is we looked at the cannabinoid receptor, how cannabinoid receptor binds to THC. You see these black molecules here. These are 
phenyl alanine residues that form a hydrophobic pocket in which this, this THC is bound. So what we decided then is we, to use this click sex approach to click in the benzyl residue, which mimics kind of the phenyl alanine. And we use this for the selection. And again, so that's how we immobilize. Still, we used immobilized target for this approach. And what you can see here is that we succeeded in binding. So that's the binding of, of a monoclonal aptamer that we have selected from this, by this approach. And this has one T residue, so one EDU residue here, which is, has been modified with this B here. That's the benzyl. And you see that's the binding we got. If we have a, another hydrophobic or aromatic systems clicked in, you see still that there's some binding. But if you get away from this, so more charged or aliphatic, see that there's a strong loss of binding. And so that's how we can use this technology now to, to tailor these libraries that we're using for in vitro selection and then um, generate aptamers for targets that we have not been able to generate. And we are quite free in the way what, what we click in. So all these residues that you can see here, they can be clicked in, they can be used also for in vitro selection purposes. And so it's quite flexible in this regard. And it's very straightforward. If you have an aptamer like this, then you can click in different type of molecules. See, okay, there's a still binding or you can modulate the binding activity as well. So this brings me to the end. So there's a lot of information that I've shown you today. And so there are various new or rediscovered CELEX approaches, which is capture CELEX, CE CELEX, or also automated selection, um, which is which helps you in inheriting aptamers for specific target molecules, especially for small molecules. The chemistry and the expired alphabet enabled aptamers, I think this is a very interesting and very approach allows you to get aptamers with color properties. And they allow also to enlarge the target space, um, which is then accessible for aptamers selection. You get to get the novel aptamers and maybe allow you to get the novel applications. So with this, I rushed to the, oh, 50 minutes. I thank you for your attention and I hope um, I can answer the question right away. Well, thank you very much, Günther. That was uh, really, really interesting. I haven't dealt with Aptimus for quite a while, and um, I'm sort of only peripherally aware of all these new developments. So that's been really interesting to catch up with that. There are a few questions already. Okay. Would you like me to read them to you, or would you prefer to read them yourself? I'll uh, read them to me, and then I answer right away. Okay. Uh, Stiliana asks, regarding PCR artifacts, would it be possible to get rid of the artifacts by performing gel extraction post-PCR. I've noticed that a couple of bands appeared out of the blue after the fifth round of selection without changing any conditions. Okay, um, the, the simple question is no. So we tried it. So we tried to, to cut out the correct band from the gel and went through the next selection cycle and just the artifacts appeared again after one or two cycles. So my advice would be really, if you get these artifacts, skip the library and design a new library that don't prove, um, produce these artifacts and use this. Um, we never get rid of these artifacts in our course we have them. And then Stiliana again, regarding in vivo Celix, is there a specific reason for selecting a 20 minute circulation time? Do you think that increasing the circulation time could give rise to potentially more aptamer sequences? Um, so we have chosen the 20 minutes just because we thought it would be a good idea. So it was our first attempt to do this. And I definitely would say we should increase the circulation time and to, let's say, 40 minutes or even 60 minutes. Um, and this could increase the, the potential which means much better. But we haven't done it so far. But I think that's a, a good question and a very good hint. And I would suggest to do so, yes. Um, and then we have a question from Dario. Would it be possible to get rid of PCR bias by next generation analysis, next generation sequencing analysis? Um, no, I don't think so, because PCR analysis is done, or NGS is done after the selection, so you don't get rid of it. So you can't get rid of PCR bias. It's, it's an inherent property of the library that you're using. It's not by the method that you have done. You have to avoid it, 
and you can avoid it by these karma binding, karma binding side design or by a multi or progressive by this way. But by NGS, it wouldn't be helpful. Okay, um, one question. Sutini, which promising methods would you recommend to determine the KD value of Aptimus? Okay, there are quite a few. So, um, what we are using in the lab is we, for proteins and targets, we often use filter retention analysis with radioactive labeled RNA and DNA. We also do um, flow cytometry with immobilized targets. We do SPR analysis using biocore. And for small molecules, it's also ITC. It can be very helpful. And so, isotermal calibration, calorimetry. And so, these are the methods that we are currently using. We also use kind of um, a loner type of assays where we immobilize the targets on microtiter plates and then use increasing amount of, of, of nucleic acids. We measure it as a type of you know, fluorescence or conjugated um, PL systems. So these are the, I think, the, the major um, methods that we can use. There are new methods coming up, like biosensor methods and stuff. We haven't experienced with this, but they might be also very helpful. But I will always re recommend to use two um, methods for KD determination of a new lab to have to um, Olga wants to know if you have seen PCR byproducts with click silex. Yes, we did. That's a short answer, but we did. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? I think someone is typing. So basically, click silix is your preferred method, Gunther? Uh, no, it's not. So it's, it really depends on what you what you want to do. So um, for for let's say if you want to address intracellular targets, we're using RNA because we can express RNA inside cells. And um, for for diagnostic approaches, we would currently use a mixture of DNA or click modified DNA because we don't know what epitopes we are addressing, but that, that's so more or less the nucleic acid we're using. But for quick stalax, it's still so, I think we've published three papers on it, we're still developing the method kind of, and, and we hope that we can see similar things as so much as also so that we can generate happiness to more complex targets or more diverse set of targets than we made. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, one more question from Sutney. How can we choose the Aptima candidate from the data obtained from next generation sequencing? Should it be based on enrichment analysis or abundance? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we have to differentiate the, the kind of target. So if, if the target is a homogeneous target, purified and you do NGS with this, I would go for those that have the highest uh, frequencies of abundance and test them. Um, if it's for complex target, this can be very different. So we have um, we, we have um, seen that low abundant targets, but with a certain enrichment profile, have still good targeting capabilities. So I would look at both. So if you do the analysis, you can look at both the enrichment profiles alongside the, the purpose of the selection, but also frequency or amplification profiles that we have also this would be very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, Olga is asking if regardless of immune response, is click salix better for in vivo salix? I can't answer. I don't know. We we never tested an an in vivo and a click selected aptimer in vivo yet. Uh, I don't know. 
And Vitor is asking if potentially a very basic question, but what would be your definition of an optima? That's a good question. So basically, it's a, it's a, an optima is a nucleic acid that binds with high affinity and a certain degree of specificity to a target molecule. So we, we see optimas in nature all over the place, right? So every protein that interacts with a, a, the RNA or DNA, DNA, the RNA is kind of an optima. So historically, it's an in vitro selected optima. It's a sequence that has been selected from the library of sequences and has gone through an enrichment processes. But we also know that there are sequences like AS1411 out there that is, um, has not been selected. It has been designed as a G-rich nucleotide or oligonucleotide, and using it because it kills cells very effectively. And so it's still we know that it has a, a molecular target and it can be considered as an atom. So that's a very broad definition, but it's in the plate acid that binds to a specific target. Um, are there any more questions, anyone? No? Then thank you very much, Gunther. That was a great talk. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to do all this. Um, and um, oh, I think someone is t typing at the moment. No? Yes, a few are typing. Um, and we hope to see you all at the OTS meeting in Munich. Thank you very much, Günther. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.